Last week we finished up looking at the, how long-term climate evolution on the Earth is controlled by the cycling of carbon between the atmosphere, the oceans, and carbonate sediments. And that this controls CO2 in the atmosphere by feedbacks with weathering of rocks on the continents and with re-release of CO2 from the atmosphere. And it maintains it in a balance so that there's water in all time. So this is showing the evolution of CO2 over the last 500 million years on the top. And then when there are ice on the Earth, large ice sheets. And so we, we geologists break up the, the last 500 million years into what we call greenhouse periods. Um, when there are no ice sheets anywhere, not at the poles, nowhere are very little, short-lived if we have them, and ice house periods when there are extensive ice sheets at the poles. And that, like I said, those are maintained. They go out of equilibrium, but they come back again due to feedbacks, due to the weathering of rocks and then precipitation of carbonate rocks in those oceans. And, um, and they're controlled by variations in the rate of seafloor spreading. High rates of seafloor spreading, more CO2 in the atmosphere, greenhouse climates. And just looking at some of these carbonate sediments that are so important in our climate cycle, these are looking at different kinds of things that form it. On the top left, they're whitings that's precipitating out of the, out of the ocean, algae that are, not, that are calcareous, ooids. And I just read that there's a company that's trying to mine these and sell them to make bioplastics, okay? And then the normal corals that most people are familiar with. These are the kinds of um, things that are controlling our climate. Well, when we look back over time, we find that those rates that are happening in the seafloor spreading is changing our environment in other ways as well. And one of the things that is happening is it's changing the ocean chemistry. And we find evidence that if you look back over time, the ooids, if you look at them in cross section, this one, they look like this, where you see all this radiating bits. That is a, an ooid that was originally calcite, a form of calcium carbonate. Ooids today, however, lack those radiating structures and instead are not made out of calcite. They're made out of aragonite. So over those time periods, driven by rates of seafloor spreading, the oceans have changed in the amount of calcium and magnesium in their chemical composition. So this is an interesting study that people have found and they're now looking at how these changes in ocean chemistry might be, might be influencing evolution because we see it in all the fossils as well that during times of high calcite seas there tend to be, and that's what all these blue things, fossils that create calcite in their skeletons and during the ice house time when you have more magnesium, we have times when it's aragonite in their skeletons. And so it's looking at how are these changes in the ocean chemistry influencing the biological evolution of life. Now what I'm going to do for the last part of this talk, well, most of it, is focus on the last 65 million years, which over here is shown by the rising slope. Okay, and we're going to talk now, we're going to move away from evolution and talk about climate change. And what this chart is showing is a variety of different methods where we can get out what the environment was like over the last 65 million years. So what CO2 was like, and it was high, okay, earlier on. That's the end of the greenhouse period, okay, moving into the ice house period. And sea level was high too, as you would expect. There's no ice at the poles, it's all in the oceans. And also this delta 13C, that's just a thing that we measure in carbonates. It has the ratio of the different isotopes of carbon in fossils. And it reflects both ice, uh, and that tells us it should say oxygen, <laughs> delta, um, delta 18O. It's the amount of oxygen in it and in the carbonate, and it reflects both ice volume and also temperature, and they move in the same direction. So at the bottom, it's warmer, and at the top, it's colder. So what we're seeing is a general transition from a greenhouse into an ice house. And we can see that over here with the evidence about when ice sheets began to develop. So the East Antar the Antarctic ice sheets grew and then shrank on the left. And then in the last about 15 million years, the Northern Hemisphere ice sheets 
develop, first on Greenland, and then the last three million years expanded to what we know as the ice ages, where they come down across Ohio and back again. So CO2 has something to do with this, but there's a lot more involved as well. And uh, as we can see, if you look at the CO2, it's pretty stable during the period when, temp when ice growth is the biggest, when the northern hemisphere ice sheets are growing. So there's a lot of other factors that are playing a role here. And what we're going to do for the rest of this talk is look at some of those factors that are influencing the Earth's climate. So one of the factors um, that we've heard about, so you have during, starting about 40 million years ago, India began to crash into the Eurasian continent, developing in, over the last 50 million years, really growing the Himalayan mountains. Now that is thought to influence climate in a large number of ways. One, if you grow the mountains, maybe you'll increase weathering. And there's some evidence to suggest that. And if you have more weathering, that brings us back to our carbon cycle that controls climate. You're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere by that weathering and then putting it into sediments, okay? And so you're making it colder. There, that is under discussion right now and under research, that theory. And it, they turn it around, a chicken and egg thing, and say, well, maybe colder climates drove uplift of mountains. Maybe you had more rainfall, and therefore more weathering, and therefore more uplift, because if you take the weight off the mountain, it bounds right back up. So there's a lot of questions that people are answering and trying to understand about how this uplift of mountains that happened not just here, but all over the, the globe during the Cenozoic could have been influencing climate. But there's one way for sure, and this is looking at the Himalayan mountains, and what we see is clouds gathered all along the top of it and then none on the other side. And this is the rain shadow effect. Mountains stop the rain, the rain goes up over it, it gets cold, they drop out all their rain, and so on the, on the other side of the mountains you have a desert, okay? So certainly during that time, the uplift of the Himalayan mountains and other mountains around the world changed climate and changed ecology and changed environments in many ways by drying the system out. And there's a lot of evidence for drying going on during that time. So we go from this wet, humid world where the dinosaurs were to a very different environment where we have grasslands evolving for the first time. Okay, so that's one way that plate tectonics and, and climate could be changing. So also during this last 65 million years, we were setting up, the world was setting up the circulation system of the oceans that it has today. The ocean is not always circulated like it does. This shows the modern circulation pattern. And what happens is you have surface waters that might go north through the Atlantic. And I grew up in Massachusetts, and Cape Cod is always very warm because there's a warm current that goes right by it and brings up all this warm warm stuff. So this is bringing heat, okay, from the equator where it's warmer up and warming the high latitudes, okay? It's a very important part of our climate system, this conveyor belt that transports heat where the sun is, from where it's shining the most, up to the high latitudes. And then it gets cold and it gets dense and it sinks. And it then travels as deep water in the blue down and around the earth. Today, the Antarctica is isolated. That water just kind of circles around in a circle around it. And Antarctica is cold because that heat is not being brought all the time. It's just trapped within this circulating ocean. So we can look at how that modern ocean circulation pattern evolved and look at it in terms of opening of ocean gateways. And we'll talk about two of them that have been important, though there are others. And so the one set is this separation of Antarctica from the rest of the continents with the Drake Passage and the Tasmanian Sea. When those formed, that's when we finally separated South America from Antarctica and there were an opening, okay? So that that current that goes around could go around and around and around Antarctica. And it's related to, the timing 
is iffy and there's other factors, but this is a big part of what caused glaciers to develop in Antarctica is the separation by plate tectonic processes of Antarctica allowing that ocean that that Antarctic current to develop. We're going to look now at over here. Let's see if that develops the Isthmus of Panama. The closing of that. So in the geologic past until about 3 million years ago that was not present. And we had the fossils of South America, I mean that animals of South America isolated geographically from those of North America. And also ocean circulation was able to transfer through that isthmus and so it had a more, you know, going around the continent rather than bringing heat up to the northern hemisphere kind of circulation. So what happened is about 3 million years ago, the isthmus of Panama closed and we had this great exchange where fossils from South America and mammals traveled north and, and animals from North America traveled south and it caused a big extinction. So it has influences on the ecology and evolution as well as on climate. It also is thought this change in ocean circulation of thought to lead to the develop of what we know today as the interglacial glacial periods. When we have today, we're in an interglacial. There's ice on Greenland, but not much else. But 10,000 years ago, a long period of glaciation, a glacial ended, where ice shown in black extended down here to Ohio. Okay, and those have gone expanded and retreated many, many times over the last three million years. So what we're looking at here is this delta 18 O again, okay, which is how we get at ancient temperature and ancient ice volumes. And we see that the changes are small. There's not a lot of, a lot of ice growing and shrinking and then they get big. Okay. And each one of these is showing the expansion and contraction, the growth and retreat of ice sheets of these glacial interglacial periods. And they happen on a periodic basis. And we talked about it a little bit in the questions last week about what might be driving it. And it's, it's clockwork. It's predictable. We can know when the next ice age should be based on the rotation of the sun and I mean of the earth around the sun. And there's three factors that play a role. One is precession, which is basically which way the earth is pointing when it's closest to the sun or further at its furthest approach. And that can vary. Okay. The second is obliquity, which is the tilt of the earth. And it varies between 22 to 24 and a half. And then also the eccentricity of the orbit of the earth around the sun. Sometimes it's much more circular and sometimes it's much more elongate. And these occur on different time scales in predictable ways. They were predicted and calculated by hand by Milankovitch a hundred years ago. But when they calculate those different time scales, so this is just showing the frequencies of precession, obliquity, eccentricity, and they get this pattern and then they compare it statistically with what they see in the ice, in the records of temperature and ice volume changes and they compare extremely well. So we can predict when ice ages should occur and when not very well with that, with this um, process. And, um, and I, what I'll talk about after Jim talks actually is some aspect of this, which is that it works so well that we can use it to date things. It's so precise that if we can see, find these details in the rock record, in the sediments of the core, then we can date things. And we'll compare the dating that we get from looking at these from these cycles to dating that we get from dating radiometrically, which Jim will talk about volcanic ash deposits. What about the circulation when we lose all, if we lose all of the ice in the northern hemisphere and, and most of it in the southern hemisphere, what about that circulation between uh, the floor on the Florida back in the Cretaceous 65 million years ago and longer. Okay. There was, which I didn't talk about, but there was a sea, the Tethys. Okay. Which was between Africa and Europe and this sea in India was part of it. You know, India closing against Europe was part of that Tethian sea. And 
that sea was shallow and warm. And what is thought to have happened, and there's evidence, normally if you went down in the ocean today, right, you would go down, it'd be warm at the surface, you'd go deeper and deeper and deeper, and it would get colder and colder and colder, okay? When they look at sediments in that sea, from that sea, what they find is that they go down, 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 and it gets warmer and warmer and warmer, okay? Instead of getting colder with depth, it gets warmer with depth. And we see evidence for that also in the Ordovician, another greenhouse period in North America when, when North America was covered with a shallow sea. There's similar evidence that instead of having cold, fresh bottom waters, we had warm, saline bottom waters, okay? And this suggests that the whole circulation pattern of the Earth, is what people have suggested, was flipped and reversed so that you could then have circulation coming down from the Arctic and across the sea and over. It's not, probably not that whole scale. It's probably more localized to the Epirate Sea, to the, the um, continental sea across North America. But it's a question, it's a big question about what's going on and how that changed. And it does look like really major change in ocean circulation happened in the past. You showed an interglaci interglacial map where Greenland was the only place left with ice. That was at the maximum meltdown, right? And isn't it true that today Greenland is losing its ice? Are we going to have even less ice than at the inter, uh, interglacial maximum melt? Yes. So that's, that's one of the questions is how fast will Green, Greenland's ice melt with the CO2 and the global warming forces that we're putting into the atmosphere? And, um, And we are now have more CO2 than we've had in the atmosphere than we've ever had at times when Greenland was still there. And that has led Hansen, who suggests that we should aim for 350 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, to argue that we're way beyond the, the safe limit, okay? It's that story looking at how and when the ice on Greenland melts relative to you know, where CO2 is, how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. So we are doing changes to our atmosphere that are big, even compared to those immense glacial interglacial cycles. Can you turn back to the uh, map? It appears that the southern continents are narrower at the bottom than they are at the top, and even including Greenland and India is is that just a coincidence or? There's a couple of things going on here. One is that this is a projection, which means that the high latitudes have been expanded. So Greenland looks bigger than it is relative to the United States, right? The Greenland is not bigger than the United States. It looks that way in this projection. People can play all sorts of fancy games with maps and how they decide to project it, right? <laughs> The second thing is that you're right. In reality, yes, there is more continental landmass in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. And that's why it's northern hemisphere glacier. It's easier to grow ice sheets on land than on ocean. And so it's the northern hemisphere cycle that's really controlling and being the clockmaker for what's going on with these because of that extra landmass. It's an important part of it. I'm going to talk about uh, volcanoes and climate. Almost all volcanism uh, that happens on the Earth is directly related to plate tectonics. Magmas are formed when plates spread apart, a new oceanic crust is formed, and they're also formed when the plates go back down and subduct. And that's 95% of all of the magmatism and volcanism on the Earth is directly related to those fundamental plate tectonic processes. When uh, a volcano, a large volcano, erupts, this is a uh, Pinatubo, which was uh, one of the largest volcanoes of the 20th century, uh, they can eject an enormous amount of material uh, into the Earth's atmosphere and even up into the Earth's stratosphere. And those have both short-term and long-term influences on climate. I'm going to focus primarily on the short-term effects of that. I'll touch a little bit on, on the long-term effects, but I'm going to focus mainly on the human timescales, how these eruptions uh, can change climate. So the, first, we should look at all of the different things that get ejected out of volcanoes. So this is a subduction zone type volcano. They, they tend to 
to erupt uh, very explosively. They have a lot of gas in them that uh, gives them a lot of energy. And they can erupt lots of ash. This isn't ash like uh, fire ash, but it's little bits of silicate material. Think of little tiny bits of pumice and pumice, and they can eject those up, up into the stratosphere. And a lot of gas comes out as well. Uh, CO2 comes, comes out, and that has an important influence on long-term climate. And sulfur dioxide also uh, comes out of these volcanoes. Both of these are greenhouse gases. Uh, they both absorb energy and can, and can make the Earth warmer. But for the SO2, it's not an effective greenhouse gas on the Earth. It can be on other planets. It's thought to have been on Mars. But what happens in, in Earth is very quickly that sulfur dioxide reacts to form sulfuric acid. Some of it comes back out as acid rain, which is one of the hazards of this type of volcano. Um, but a lot of it also reacts to make tiny little nanoscopic and microscopic sulfate particles in the Earth's uh, stratosphere and atmosphere. And those are really important because they're tiny little reflectors that reflect the sun's radiation back and don't let it get to the Earth. So you have greenhouse effects, which can warm, uh, lead to warmth. And you have these reflection effects due to having these particles in there that lead to cooling. The cooling parts are the dominant short-term effect. Um, and these greenhouse gases really control the long term. So on the long term, and uh, Beverly has already talked about this, you have the long term uh, carbon cycle that, that she's already discussed. Uh, and just to go over this very quickly again, you have carbon dioxide that can be taken out of the atmosphere, dissolve in the ocean, and organisms use it to make their shells out of calcium carbonate. Those can be subducted back down, and they go down to the subduction zone where they heat up, the carbonates break down, form carbon dioxide again, and those come back up out of volcanoes. And on a long time scale, the balance between what's going down, coming, coming out, and what's coming back out again is what's kept the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere more or less in a, in a particular range. It's in a steady state. But like Beverly said, if you change the subduction rates, if you change the amount of limestone that happens to be going down, you can change the amount of CO2 that comes up and that can have important long-term effects on climate. But in the short term, the carbon dioxide, and this is a graph of the carbon dioxide that's measured in Hawaii. This is the longest term observatory where our best CO2 measurements come from for the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, as uh, we know, the, the carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere has been increasing at a, at a pretty rapid rate uh, throughout uh, industrial times. Um, it's sometimes suggested that volcanism may play a part in this, uh, this rise in CO2. But uh, if we go around the globe and measure and calculate how much carbon dioxide is coming out of volcanoes all around the globe, add it all up, and take the highest estimates of that, it's not even close. The, the amount of carbon dioxide that's coming out of volcanoes is tiny compared to what we're, what is coming out due to human activities. So this plot, this is the ratio of the carbon dioxide that is produced uh, anthropogenically and uh, what is coming out of volcanoes, and less than 1% of the total is from that. So here is a, a picture of, uh, of the aftermath of Pinatubo. This is a year later, this is in Hong Kong, but all over the world you had uh, beautiful sunsets um, that, that are due to fine dust particles and these little sulfate aerosols in, in the atmosphere um, after the eruption. And those traveled all around the globe. Um, Tambora eruption was a much larger eruption that happened in 1815. It produced amazing sunsets also that are the inspiration. This has nothing to do really with my talk, but. It's just interesting. Uh, the, the, we're the inspiration for Turner, to, to uh, a famous landscape painter, to paint a whole series of, of paintings uh, based on those sunsets. The Krakatoa eruption in 1883 uh, produced sunsets like these that, that inspired this famous painting. Um, these, these are the, the materials that cause the sunsets and also cause the cooling. Uh, these little tiny particles, uh, 100 nanometer in scale up to a micron in scale, and they, they have a big influence because they can stay up in the stratosphere for, for a long period of time. So what these do, they're tiny little reflectors that reflect the sun's radiation back and they cause 
they lead to cooling because not as much radiation makes it down to the Earth's surface. So here's an example of, of the aerosol plume, how much dust and, and sulfate uh, aerosol material uh, was injected into the atmosphere and stratosphere by Pinatubo eruption in 1991. So this is the background. This is before the eruption. And what you're looking at, this, let me uh, advance forward here. This, this is what's called the optical depth, which is a measure of how much sunlight is prevented from reaching Earth's surface. So the more red colors, you've got a thick uh, band of ash that's not letting sun through. So that's the background. Pinatubo erupted on June 15, 1991. And this is uh, for about a one month period uh, after Pinatubo averaged. So there's a lot of material that's starting to circulate around the Earth, and then it spreads with time, and it has an important effect for a few years afterward. Um, over the globe, the average amount of cooling due to that plume of material was about one degree Fahrenheit for a couple of years after the Pinatubo eruption. Tambora eruption is about 10 times the size of, of Pinatubo. This is in Indonesia, the largest eruption in uh, recorded history that we know about and can trace to the actual volcano. There are actually large volcanic eruptions that happened in history that we have no idea where they came from. We see the record of them in ice cores, but the volcano is gone. It's been exploded. Uh, it's probably an island that just went away. Um, but this was the largest eruption uh, in, in recorded history, and it had enormous effects on climate all around the globe, particularly in Europe, uh, lowered temperatures by, by several degrees. This, the year after Tambora is, is known as the year without a summer. Uh, during June of that year, there was snow in Albany, um, and there was widespread crop failure and famine. Uh, the largest famine of the 19th century happened in the aftermath of Tambora uh, due to the cooling to, to all those aerosol particles. Um, another eruption, which is a different kind. Um, it's not only the large eruptions that happen at once, like Pinatubo, these subduction zone type volcanoes that can lead to this, this type of cooling effect. Uh, the Lockheed eruption in Iceland, which occurred over a nine month period, it's a long term, it didn't all happen at once. This is on a mid-ocean spreading ridge. Iceland is the only piece of land that's on a ridge. And there was a, vol there was a series of uh, volcanic outpourings over a nine month period here in Lockheed. This is a, a picture of, of the fissure uh, where, where the lava was uh, coming out. There wasn't a lot of ash produced in this series of eruptions, but there was a lot of sulfur dioxide that came out that reacted to form sulfuric acid and sulfate. And there was a, a blue sulfur dioxide haze that, that lingered over Iceland and then moved across into Europe and caused widespread crop failures on Iceland. 24% uh, of the population died, 75% of the livestock. And it also had major effects in, in Europe. Uh, the famine that resulted from that was one of the factors in the French Revolution. Um, here is a, a modern volcano, Ambrim Volcano. It's in the South Pacific. Uh, it erupted in 2005 and was the largest source of sulfur dioxide in that year. Didn't have uh, any effect on, on global uh, cooling, but um, now NASA has satellites up to detect the, the sulfur dioxide that, that's coming out of volcanic eruptions. And from space, we could uh, detect that SO2 cloud. No effects on global cooling, but there was a lot of acid rain that was associated with this, people uh, suffering from burns. Um, back through history, so Tambora was the largest eruption in, in history, 1815. Um, but there have been much larger eruptions going further back in geological time. For perspective, here's Mount St. Helens. Uh, this little dot here, it's about one cubic kilometer of material was erupted from that. Pinatubo had about 10 cubic kilometers of volcanic material uh, in, in its eruption. Long Valley Caldera, which is in Eastern California near the border with Nevada, uh, was a very large eruption, much, much larger than Pinatubo. And Toba, which happened 74,000 years ago, was one of the largest volcanic eruptions that we have evidence for anywhere in the geological record. A really a enormous uh, eruption that must have caused, had a major influence on climate, 
We don't have much to go on in the record uh, on that. There was a cooling after this that's seen in Greenland ice cores for about 1,000 years, but it, it's not known if that's related to this or not. But models suggest that for a period of five, 10 years afterward, there was major cooling, uh, basically a volcanic winter that lasted for, for years that um, is speculated to have had uh, big effects on human populations. This is around the time that humans were migrating out of Africa. Uh, but those are controversial, so I'm not going to talk about them. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale of, of what these very large eruptions look like, we have evidence for them in the geological record. This is uh, the Long Valley Caldera. So this is where the, the eruption happened from, and a huge amount of material came out of this eruption, and then there was a collapse afterward. Uh, these often end up in lakes. So there, there's a huge amount of magma that comes up, up out, gets spread around, and then there's a collapse of material and a, and a depression afterward. So this is a 10 kilometer scale bar. It's a very large caldera. That gives you a sense for how much material came out. Another way to see that is uh, to look at the volcanic material that was actually ejected from that volcano. This is the Bishop Tuff which is the volcanic products that came out of the Long Valley caldera. So for scale, this is 30 feet thick. It's 25 kilometers away from the caldera. So a long way away, that much volcanic material came out. Um, this part of it is direct airfall that came out of the volcano and just dropped uh, back down, and it traveled quite a long distance. And this part is a pyroclastic flow, which is kind of like an avalanche that travels very quickly, suspended by hot volcanic gases uh, that travels uh, down slope and uh, at hurricane speeds, very high temperatures, and deposits pumice and ash. Um, this is just a, a picture of what uh, pyroclastic flows look like in modern volcanoes. What, what, what came out of Long Valley Caldera was much bigger than these, uh, but these are ground-hugging flows that are traveling down the mountain. They kick up lots and lots of dust. They travel about 100 miles per hour down, down slope and uh, cause a lot of destruction in their, in their path. Some of these can even go across water. After Krakatoa, uh, there was a crossing uh, over six kilometers across the water that these pyroclastic flows uh, could travel. The uh, Long Valley eruption, uh, was, would that have been uh, from a hot spot or from a fault? What would have been the, the cause of that particular caldera? That uh, is not well known. There, there's volcanism throughout the, the uh, American Southwest that is related to, um, there's been diffuse uh, extension, and it's thought that part of the continental lithosphere peeled off, and then a stenospheric mantle, which is the part that flows, so the lithosphere is the hard rock part, came off, dripped down, and then the mantle came up to take its place, and whenever mantle, solid mantle rises, um, it's taking hot material from deep, bringing it shallow. At shallow levels, the melting temperature is lower, so it partially melts on the way up. So it's kind of like what happens at mid-ocean ridges, same basic process, but it's not a spreading center. It's not where you have, but it's where we think part of that lithosphere dropped off and, uh, and mantle rose up to take its place. Melt was generated during that process. So it's even ongoing now. There are places where there are, are basalts that are quite young uh, at various places throughout the, the Southwest. The uh, phenomenon at, at Yellowstone Park, is that a thinning of the crust and the magna is coming closer to the surface? That is uh, thought to be related to, it's a hot spot volcano. Um, and I know Beverly's gonna talk about that a little bit, but basically what's happened there is you have a hot spot which is relatively stationary in the mantle. Uh, the plate moves over the top of it. And you can see, you can track that movement uh, with time as the plate has moved over. So the current volcanic center that's over the plume is at Yellowstone, and the, there have been a series of eruptions over the last couple of million years, some of them even larger than this Long Valley Caldera eruption. Um, but if you go back through time, um, there's, a, there's a track. Uh, so 16 million years ago, it was, uh, the hotspot was centered underneath Oregon, 
and uh, um, and Columbia, uh, sorry, Columbia River basalt in, in Washington. Um, and, it, and it almost matches up with a very, very large outpouring of basalt that happened about 16 to 18 million years ago over a long period of time. So it wasn't one huge, lar one large eruption. But um, the, that's an example of what's known as large igneous provinces uh, that, that come out over a few million years of time. Enormous amounts of material can come out in those. Uh, so the Columbia River Plateau, which covers a large part of Washington, uh, Idaho, um, is actually one of the smaller of those. Uh, there are very large ones that cover a large part of southern India. There are the Siberian traps, and there are some in the oceans, just enormous outpourings of, of, uh, of volcanism that would have had uh, a big effect on climate. Um, those are not well understood. Uh, one idea for those is that you have the, the head of a plume that's coming up, uh, and there's a, a huge amount of, of material in the, in the plume head. And then uh, what follows after that, uh, so there's a, a large amount of, uh, of magma produced that, that comes up to the surface. And after that, you have the little tail of the plume that's coming up from the deep mantle uh, that continues to, to bring a flow, but on a much smaller scale. Uh, that's probably the prevailing idea, but they're, they're really not very well understood. But these are the largest outpourings of, of magma that we, that we have. As for the record, uh, what about the primitive and the modern volcanoes eruption? The gas evolved from those primitive and modern, modern volcanoes uh, affecting the uh, environment, uh, just like the gas is sulfate or the carbon dioxide, whether it is uh, helping uh, to increase the carbon dioxide on the surface or as you, as you told that the, uh, as for the record of the uh, primitive, volcanoes, the, uh, those uh, uh, sulfates are just going down. That means uh, cooling the temperature. Uh, is that helping for this all uh, uh, climatic condition for cooling? Uh, for, uh, as for the record of the primitive, with respect to, with compared to the moder modern volcano? I, I'm not sure I, I understand your, your question completely, but if you go back through time, we do have evidence on uh, through the historical record, a lot of it comes from looking at ice cores for the gas emissions that come out. So you can see the record, for example, of the Toba eruption that, uh, that happened 74,000 years ago. You see that in the ice core. There's a lot of sulfate material that came out uh, during that eruption that you find in Greenland uh, ice cores. Um, uh, there are also eruptions that, that you find in there that you can't link to anything that, that uh, also show up in those ice cores. Um, but is, is your question about how, how those affected climate back then, they would have had similar effects in terms of the, the sulfur dioxide. Um, and you, know, you, could, you could take that and estimate how much sulfur dioxide came out and, and do models to see how that would have affected climate. All of the cooling effects um, happen over a relatively short period of time. So uh, a few years to maybe a decade. After that, slowly all of those aerosol materials are removed from the atmosphere and they no longer uh, contribute to cooling. The carbon dioxide, on the other hand, is a long-term thing. It doesn't have any effect in the short term unless maybe there's a really, really large uh, eruption. Um, but over the long term, the balance between the carbon dioxide that comes out of the volcano and what's going down and the, what, what's being removed uh, from carbonate and organic matter, the balance between those is on the long term geological timescales controls the CO2 in the atmosphere and that, that uh, helps regulate climate. Uh, that means uh, carbon di dioxide is balanced totally, uh, balanced, but the sulfate is uh, helping for global warming, right? Sulfate gas. Yeah, sulfate, yeah. The sulfate on the Earth doesn't really have any long-term impacts because it, it goes up, it stays for you know, a few years, maybe a decade and a very large eruption, and then it's all back out again. What I'm going to talk about next, this is uh, in response to uh, questions that, that, that I got uh, in the first talk and that I think came up again with Beverly, but uh, just to discuss how 
radioactive dating methods ra based on radioactive decay work. Um, here's an example of one common type of radioactive decay that, that is used for dating. Um, this is a depiction, a simplified depiction of an atomic nucleus. And uh, one common mode of decay is to have a beta particle, which is basically an electron, ejected from the nucleus. It's ejected from a neutron. The neutron turns into a proton. So it doesn't change much the mass of the, the nucleus. The electron doesn't, doesn't have much mass. But uh, it changes it to a proton, which changes the element. And um, one example of a uh, radioactive decay that, that's used for dating, this is the one that I'm going to focus on, is potassium-40, uh, which decays actually in two different ways. It can decay to calcium-40 and to argon-40. Um, this is the, the one that's used for dating uh, for reasons that I'll get into. Argon is very, makes it very nice for dating because it's a noble gas. It doesn't want to be in a rock. It wants to be in the atmosphere. And we do have a lot of argon-40 in the atmosphere. It's about 1% of the atmosphere that's due to decay of potassium-40 in the Earth over its history. Um, so it wants to be in the atmosphere, doesn't want to be in the rock. Um, as the potassium-40 decays away to create argon-40, if it's in a rock at, at low temperatures, it can't get out. It escapes. At high temperatures, it can escape. So it dates the cooling of rocks. The way this works, the, the basic decay process, it's a spontaneous, it's a random process, but there's a certain probability that a potassium-40 will decay by one of these two routes um, in a specified amount of time. So with time, it's an exponential decay. A certain proportion of those potassium-40 atoms, which is very predictable, uh, will, will decay. OK, so this is basically how that works. Um, if you start with uh, potassium-40 up here, it decays away exponentially. Um, this is time and number of half-lives. The half-life is the amount of time that it takes for half of the potassium-40 to decay away. So in that, in that time, any individual potassium-40 atom uh, within one half-life has a 50-50 chance of undergoing a decay. Um, at the same time, argon-40 accumulates in, in the sample. Every time there's a potassium-40 that undergoes decay, well, not every time because some of it goes to calcium, uh, but uh, you produce an argon-40, a certain proportion of argon-40. And it's hard to use this to, for dating. We don't look at the potassium-40 in the sample and uh, figure out, oh, how much was there in the beginning. The way we do it is we look at how much argon-40 has accumulated in the sample, and that tells, uh, and then measure how much potassium-40 is in the sample. Together, those tell you how much was present originally, and if you know what the half-life is, you can get the date. Um, this is just to show that the half-life can be measured experimentally. Um, I'm not going to talk about it unless there's a question about it, uh, because Patricia told me I shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> but um, doing, doing this type of, type of experiment where you, where you measure the rate of decay, uh, uh, the, the number of decays for a certain, you know, in this case, potassium-40 over a period of time, you can calculate what the decay constant is, and you can calculate what the half-life is, even though you're only measuring the sample for a tiny fraction of its half-life. And the half-life of potassium-40 uh, is experimentally determined to be 1.277 billion years. So it has a very long half-life. Um, all of the radioactive systems, and there are many of them that can be used to date rocks, have uh, uh, almost all of them have these very long half-lives. Um, so how does this system work? If you have uh, an outpouring of basalt, for example, uh, there's liquid lava. Argon-40 can very easily escape from this lava. It, it's a high temperature. It's in a liquid. It can diffuse out and make its way into the atmosphere. But as it cools, and uh, a small basalt flow can cool on a time scale of days to weeks, um, it cools down to room temperature, and all of the argon-40 is trapped. So when this rock formed, there was almost no argon-40 in it to begin with. But as long as it sits there at the Earth's surface at low temperature, argon-40 will slowly accumulate, can't get out anymore, 
and gets locked in. So measuring the amount of argon-40 in the rock, measuring the, measuring the amount of, amount of potassium-40, we can date the rock. Um, there are a lot of tricks involved in how you actually do that, um, make those measurements, but it's a very robust technique. You can compare it to other radioactive schemes. As Beverly will talk about, you can compare it with other means of dating, uh, like orbital time scales. And now, Beverly will describe an example of that. All right, so I'm going to go through a little case study. And this is from work that I'm doing with Johannes Haile Selassie, who I think came and spoke to this group about early human evolution and the work we're doing in the Warrenzo Mili project area in the Afar of Ethiopia. So he would talk about fossils, which are found all along. This is Ethiopia and the East African Rift System. And this is a place where the plates are spreading apart um, and creating new ocean floor in the Red Sea. OK, so there's active tectonism going on there, but there's also a lot of volcanoes. So I'm not going to talk about the fossils right now, though that's why we go. I'm going to talk about the sediments and the volcanoes a little bit. So it happens that there are a lot of volcanoes there that make it easier to date the fossils. So this is where we work, the War Mill project area, right in the middle of all that action. And so these are examples of the sedimentary rocks that we see there in which people find fossils and hunt for fossils. And the thing to note here is that there are a lot of tufts, some of them thin, like this one, some of them thicker, this one's a few like maybe 10 feet thick. This one's probably 20 feet thick, okay, that we have. And we've named them because we know them very well. And we can trace them out around the area where they're finding fossils and know everywhere where I see this tuff that I've named, it's the same age. So the fossils here are the same age, even if I go, you know, 10 kilometers away, because I see the same tuff. So it's important because it, they are timelines for us in piecing together the puzzle that is the broken up, there's faults in there, record of this area where we're finding fossils. Well, what we do with those tufts, some of it we can just look at them and we can tell they're the same, but we make mistakes. Okay, <laughs> This one looks like it and it's not. So we test it in other ways too. This is volcanic, this is pumice, volcanic glass that comes that's, that the, makes up those tufts, okay? And so these are tufts are falling out volcanic tephra deposits, okay? We study those volcanic glass, the geochemistry of them using a fancy piece of equipment called a microprobe. And what we can do with those tufts, and this is just, I just don't pay attention to it, but it's a statistical analysis, okay? Where um, the different ones, there used to be things on it, that we can group the tufts according to their geochemistry, according to their aluminum and calcium and titanium, and they're distinctive. Okay, so one TEF will have the same geochemistry everywhere we see it, and it will be different from other ones. And so it helps us test our correlations of these TEFs around the area where we go. Now, a lot of the TEFs that we have in this area are local. We see the volcanoes from which they must have come from, and they're 10 kilometers away, not very far away. And that's why they're, you know, 10 feet thick. They haven't traveled very far. But some of them seem to have come, oh, this is, so this is grouping over them, okay? Some of them seem to have come from much greater distances. So I'm gonna talk about one, we have several. Okay, and they're different in that they're very fine grained. Okay, the other, the, the ones that are from close are big chunks of pumice, sometimes very large. These are very fine grained. This tuff here is more than three meters thick. Okay, um, so 10 feet <laughs> that we can see of it. And we can find it all over our area. All right. But what's, I think, particularly neat about this one, we can use those same processes, looking at the geochemistry of the tuff, um, and, and tie it to other areas around the world. All right. Now, we also have I've been able to date it. Al Dano in, uh, in Berkeley has dated it using argon-argon, which Jim talked about, all right, on, on feldspar minerals in the tuff. Okay? and come up with an age of 3.57 plus or minus a small bit million years old, okay? So we have a very precise within 10,000 years, okay, date for the age of this tuff for the eruption. 
So now we can take it and look at other field areas like in Kenya and also in deep sea cores where people find tufts. Okay? And we have studied the geochemistry of our tuff and we find that it matches the geochemistry of these other ones all over this area in Turkana and Kenya and across in the deep sea core. So it's a very widespread horizon that we are able to see and correlate with the same processes uh, between these different areas. Okay, we see it in all of those places and tie it to our area. And so what we find, I, like I told you, that tuff, it's 10 feet thick where we work in the War Mill project area. Now they've been able to identify the source of it and it's about 500 miles away. Okay, so think how big this thing is. It's, Jim showed you the, um, the Long Valley Caldera Tuff, or maybe it was the Bishop Tuff. Anyway, it was the Bishop Tuff. It was 30 feet thick from 25 kilometers away. This is 10 feet from 500 miles. It's a big, big, big eruption. And the calculations that we do are that it's on par with the Yellowstone volcano. So some of the biggest that we have in the world, the one we've talked about, we see this one here in Ethiopia. Interestingly, we see it again and again, too. There are several tufts that we see in the succession that are equally big and that we see that are coming in through that thing, through that process. So those humans that were evolving in Ethiopia at this time were facing some, some challenging time, all the kinds of things that Jim told you about. So now getting back to another May of talking, we talked about orbital changes and how that is changing the ice ages and that it's a, it's a clockwork. Okay, it tells you very predictable when it's happening. Well, in Ethiopia, what that does is it changes, we don't see the effect of the ice volume, it changes the strength of the monsoons. And so in those deep sea cores where we find those tufts, we also see variations, cyclical variations, in the amount of dust that's being blown off the continents because of stronger monsoons or weaker monsoons. And they vary with exactly the same kinds of frequencies that are predictable by these Milankovitch scales, what we call, or orbital changes, and that can be used as a clock. And so that has been done, and this is not the greatest picture, but we have several tufts that we now have got uh, in the, on the right are the tufts of some of that we have in Ethiopia. And they're tied to tufts that are seen in deep sea cores. And you can't see it, but those wiggles are these changes in dust. Okay? And you can date those very precisely within 10,000 years based on where that wiggle is. <laughs> All right? Where? So that based on an orbital time scale that's developed. And so what we have is that, for example, one of the tufts that Aldano dated, the that one that we talked about, 3.57 plus or minus 0.01 million years, is the same age as that same tuff that we tie it to geochemically. It plots right over with it and distinctive with it, right? That we see in the Indian Ocean within 10,000 years. So we have very good agreement between very different time scales. And this is important because it helps us. To, d to tie what's going on in the continent, okay, in terms of human evolution, to what's going on in the deep sea record, which is a very continuous record of climate change, the evolution of these monsoons and what's going on. So it helps us to understand the context for human evolution a lot better because we can tie our area to the deep sea and also to other areas where, the, where we see fossils. It also is important because it allows us to test this idea, right, that, that this orbital time scale really works, <laughs> you know, because we've got another way to get at it because we can date the same tufts that we see with it. So it, it's a feedback mechanism that we use to really understand what's going on in these, um, in these systems.